I made my first video about the Inkra Miter Express table saw sled and the Miter 1000 also by Inkra. I made that video a little over a year ago and I've gotten some really good comments and also learned some things while using this over the last 16 months or so. So I want to answer some of those comments in this video and as you can see my sacrificial fence is getting pretty beat up so uh, I want to make a new one and show you how I'm going to do that. Welcome back to the wood shop. My name's Brett. The most recent comment is kind of what inspired me to make this video, and that was by Martin. Let me get my cheaters on so I can read it. He said, I haven't seen anyone using the Miter Express with the blade tilted for angled cuts. Any thoughts on how to use it that way? Even the installation manual only focuses on the blade at 90 degrees. So yes, I will demonstrate beveled and mitered cuts and show you some of the things that this awesome sled can do. The first thing that I'll mention is that these are actually two different Inker products. You don't have to use them together, though they do work beautifully together. The Miter Express is just a table saw sled, and it's designed to be able to be used with any miter gauge. So you can use the miter gauge that your table saw came with. If the miter slot on your table saw is a T slot, and most of them are, then your miter gauge will also have this this piece here on the end that'll keep it from sliding out of the miter slot. On this slot where the miter bar goes, it's not a T-slot. So if you have that piece on there, first thing you'll need to do is remove that. Usually with one or two screws. Those are in there pretty good. Do you wanna just take my word for it? You know what, I've never taken these out and I'm already starting to strip out the screw heads, so just take my word for it. If you want to remove that, it'll fit in here. And I can get it to fit, but only that far. And then you would just tighten it down with these cam nuts just like you would with any other miter bar. You can also use the miter express without the sled, of course. And for that, you will want the T-clip installed. I don't have it installed right now because I've been using it in my sled. That'll keep it from tipping out of your T-slot like that. I think what I'm gonna do first is make the new sacrificial fence because that's gonna involve gluing up two pieces of MDF. And while that glue is drying, then I can demonstrate some other things on the table saw sled and the miter gauge. This current sacrificial fence that I have here is some MDF trim. It's a good material and a good size but I want to double up the thickness. I have more of this leftover trim. This is a 1x4 base trim piece. And a 1x4, as you probably know, is not really 1 inch by 4 inches, but it's, th it's more like 3 quarters by 3 and a half. So I need double thickness because I'm going to be adding this last bit of T-track that I have. And so my fence will need to be thicker in order to be able to mount that in there. It's not too tall, but it's also not too short. Here's an example of a cut that I had made with the blade raised to full height. So as you can see, it, it didn't cut the fence completely off, but it came pretty close. So the blade doesn't raise up to a full three and a half inches. And then when this is mounted on the sled, it raises it up another, I think, half inch. So it won't come anywhere near cutting all the way through. So this is the right material for me to use. I would recommend using something that's dimensionally stable like MDF. MDF is nice and soft on the blades too. You could use plywood, that's also dimensionally stable. I wouldn't recommend using solid wood because of wood movement. Um, this is a precision instrument and you don't want your fence to be warping and moving and changing your reference area. You want it to stay trustworthy and stable. And then for length, this current fence that I have, or the sacrificial fence, is just over 21 inches. And that was a little on the short side. The miter gauge fence itself, the aluminum extrusion, is 18 and a quarter inches. So I want to, I think I want to double that or come close to it. Uh, another consideration I have is storage. This is a small shop and i uh, kind of running out of wall space and even cabinet space. Where I've been stowing this is underneath my work surface over there on the other side of the saw. I have just an open spot underneath my countertop. That's okay, but it's not super handy. You have to walk around the saw to go get it. So I'm thinking I might make some sort of mounting structure on the wall here near the saw so that I can access it on this side of the saw, but I haven't figured out all those details yet. If I do continue to stow it underneath the countertop, the bottom of my countertop height is 
about 35 and a half inches. So um, if I go with 35 inches, that'll 35 inches will give me a pretty good coverage that goes just from the blade to this supporting bar that spans the rails. And then over here it would go beyond the table if I push it out to the limits. So yeah, I think 35 inches is going to work. And I'm going to use the miter express with the miter gauge attached to make that cross cut. But first I need to secure the miter gauge to the sled. So I'm going to take you around the back side so you can see. Before I tighten down the miter bar to the sled, I'm going to go ahead and remove the vents here. And to do that, we just loosen up the, these two, whatever they're called, socket screws. And you need this tool that comes with the miter gauge. It's got a ball head on it. And one of the commenters pointed out to me, uh, I wasn't really sure why it's made that way, but it's so that you can, if you're at a funky angle, like say this, and you're trying to get past your handle and so forth, um, you can actually get at it from an angle instead of straight on. So that's the purpose of the ball head. I keep this on a magnet strip right next to the saw on the wall. So once those are loosened, we can just slide that out. And then to tighten the bar to the sled, there's three cam nuts. And those can fit in any one of these um, threaded positions. I want my bar to be fully on the sled, so I'm just going to tighten up this one here. And I'll use the provided Allen key for that. It's an off-center cam nut, so as you tighten it, it puts pressure against the side of the miter bar. And this also lives on the magnet strip. So now we've got the bar attached to the table. There's no, no play in it at all. What you're hearing is a little bit of slop in my slot. So I should probably fix that while I have this open too. For the miter slot in the table, we've got four little socket head screws that'll tighten the bottom. Let me show you that too. So as you, as you tighten those nuts from the top, this, it spreads this aluminum bar just, just ever so slightly so that it makes good contact with your miter slot. And that's probably a different size Allen key. Yep, it is. There's like four different Allen keys that you need to make adjustments on these things. Oh, got lucky. Okay, so I got just a little bit of slop here. So I'm gonna try to shore that up a little bit. Probably won't take much. I want it so tight that it won't slide. Let's see, yeah. Ooh, it gets really tight at the end there. But for the rest of the way, it travels fine. Hmm. Okay, I'm gonna loosen that up a little bit. It's kind of a finicky process, so just take your time until you get it right. Well, it needs to slide all the way through, so let's... Getting past the end is more important for safety, especially, than the side-to-side -side slop. I don't want to get stuck in the middle of a cut. And then again, these slide into this T-slot on the back here. You want your aluminum fence close to the blade, but obviously not crossing the blade. I did make that mistake once. It's brass, 
so it won't destroy your blade but it'll dull it in a hurry so you just want to avoid running into your expensive tool and then this is just a supporting clip that mounts into here And the nut just has to slide past the end of the slot there. And there is an importance to the order in which you tighten these down. If you were to tighten this to the table first, then as you tighten this one, you may be pulling the fence askew. So you want to tighten it up to your fence first. I don't really love these triangle knobs because it doesn't quite clear the bottom there. But that's tight enough. And then go ahead and tighten it to the track. Now that's in there. Okay, almost ready to make a cross cut. And then for this drop panel, this is just material support on the left side of the blade. We want to position it so that we've got some infeed and outfeed to support the material on either side of the cut. It's got these pass through holes so you can access the nuts on the miter bar to tighten it down. We don't actually want this sliding during the cut, we want it to stay stationary. So we'll do that with this other different size Allen key. So it's kind of a lot to keep track of. The magnet strip on the wall helps out a lot. And in the other table saw sled video, I recommended that you keep this off cut from making the drop panel, that it would come in handy in certain situations. And how I've been using this is over here on the spreader bar between the rails, because this is at a different height I use this for material support over here too. And I just take a couple small clamps. I just don't want it um, sliding off. So it's okay if this slides back and forth with the piece, but I just don't want it to fall off of there. If you're going to take the time to make one, might as well make two, right? So I've got two prepped up here for the glue up. This is also a good opportunity to get rid of some of this old Type Bond 2 because I use a lot more Type Bond 3 than Type Bond 2. And you might think I'm crazy, but I'm going to try something a little different. I'm not listening to you. You're crazy. To clamp it up, I'm going to use pocket hole screws to clamp it together instead of having a big old bulky clamp sandwich. I right, feel like I want to go. I actually already pre-drilled for the screws. And isn't pre-drilling just drilling ahead of time? And I'm using inch and a quarter pocket hole screws because I got a bunch of them. And the reason I'm using pocket hole screws instead of tapered screws is because they have this washer head on it and that'll clamp against the surface and suck the two pieces together. If you do do this, don't forget to back your screws out after it dries, because that will ruin your saw. Now while those are drying, I'm going to answer Martin's question about tilting the blade in use with the miter saw sled. And in order to do that, I'm going to have to remove the drop panel, and also the throat plate.
I'm going to recreate one of the more complicated cuts I've done on that inker sled. This is the roof of a little free library that I'm building, and this piece right here has some compound angles on it. This edge is beveled, and of course this is not a 90 degree point. This angle is 108, but the bevel is actually the opposite of that, so 180 minus 108 is 72. So we'll set the tilt on the blade to 72, and then I need this angle. And, and we're getting 33 on the angle. So this angle up here is 33 degrees. So we'll set the fence on the miter gauge to 33 and the bevel on the, or the tilt on the blade to 72. And the first adjustment we'll make is the angle of the cut on the miter gauge here. So we gotta loosen all these things. And it's currently set at zero. So we gotta loosen that. There's that little pointer that goes into these notches. You gotta back that off. Loosen this. And now we can change our angle. And it was 33. Since 33 is not one of the notches, we're going to have to use this vernier scale. You can just loosen this plastic nut here a little bit and slide it up to the scale. And then we're looking at our zero line to line up our 33. Lock that in, lock this in, and lock these in. And now I can see here that the aluminum fence is going to cross my blade. So I need to slide the fence back up onto the table. Need to loosen this one again. This one's fine. And loosen these just a little bit so it can slide. And we'll get that back up on the table so we're not crossing the blade. Tighten that back down. This is that doesn't need to be tight, but this does. And this does. Okay, now we're safe. And as you can see, the blade is tilting away from the bottom of the sled here, so we're in no danger of cutting it. And then I'm going to make a test cut, and we'll see that angle on the back of the sacrificial fence here. But first I'm going to lower the blade a little bit. We don't need that much exposed. And I'm going to use this scrap piece here. i got to keep in mind where the top of my roof piece is. The bevel's going this way. That would make this the bottom and this the top. So if I'm trying to make the 33 degree point here, I'm going to have to cut all the way to this corner instead of this corner. It's really easy to screw up a cut like this. So do some testing, do some test fitting. Because this is kind of small, I'm going to use my material hold down that comes with. Okay, I don't love this about this thing. There's nothing to support it under here. It wants a tip and I can't get close enough to the piece to maybe this other way. Like right on the edge there. That's not great either. And I don't think this hold down is going to work. I'll just use a push pad. Just want to keep my fingers away from the spinning blade, you know? Well, let's see how we did. Uh, oops. <laughs> <laughs> I got something wrong. Uh, the bevel's good. That's a nice fit. So the tilt of the blade was right, but our angle up here was <laughs> way off. Looks like half. 33. How did I do that? <sighs> I was looking at this pointer. It says single cut, which I thought that's what I was making. And I was looking at the pointer going to 33. Um, I think I was looking at the wrong pointer. 
Other option is here's a pointer going to 62. 62, 33. That doesn't even make sense to me. Let's try 62, see what happens. Alright, let's see how 62 went. Still got a good bevel. No, <laughs> I guess I was a little bit off on the 62. Maybe it's 61. We gotta, we're got we meeting at the top here and we didn't quite make it over there. So, it looks like I was wrong measuring the angle. So that's why you want to cut everything oversized and do test pieces and sneak up on your cut. Because, um, like I said, this is complicated. Not sure how I got it right in the first place, but you get the idea. So now we can move on to the next thing. Okay, now these fences are dried and cured and uh, they didn't have a lot of squeeze out, but I scraped off whatever there was. I, of course, took all the screws out and there's just a little bit of a, a crown on the edges that makes it want to not sit flush against the table. So I'm gonna run these through and just trim off the top and bottom edges to make them flat. Well, that was my first time using that technique for making dados, and my results were 50-50. But I think that had everything to do with my execution and not the technique itself. So this one turned out to be a nice friction fit. I like that. Whereas this one is a little loose. It'll still work, but... I was shooting for snug. So if you're interested in learning more about that technique, there's a great video by Inspire Woodcraft. I'll leave a link for that instructional video on the screen here and down in the description. Now we can move on to the next step, which is making holes for mounting. And drilling holes is kind of boring, so you can skip ahead to another part of the video if you want. And before I make the holes for the new sacrificial fences, I just want to show you the stop block that the Mitre 1000 came with. The nuts fit into this T-track here, and um, what I don't like about it, it'll it'll stay put just fine, and it's square and it mounts. But I, I don't like this flimsy plastic cursor for the measuring tape, so I've never used it. I don't know. I suppose you could make it work, but to me, it's a little wimpy. And I've had this Katz Moses non-deflection stop lock for quite a while. I just haven't had anywhere to mount it. And that's why I put the T-track on the new sacrificial fences, because it'll, it'll mount to that. And that'll work great. And on the last page of the owner's manual, there's a little section for attaching the auxiliary fences. And it says to make your holes 9 16 up from the bottom. And I've got two setup blocks here. One's 3 8 so that's 6 16 now there's 3 sixteenths, so 6 plus 3 is 9. 
and that hits right at the center of this T-track. So I'm going to use these to mark a line on the back side of each of these fences. And then I'm going to make a mark two inches in and then every four inches after that. Now I'm going to take these over to the drill press and make a recess in each of these spots with a 5 8 inch Forstner bit. This is going to be great. Got a sturdy no deflection stop block. Yeah, this is going to be really good. Another question a viewer had asked is does the Miter Express table saw sled work on a job site saw? I believe they had the miter gauge already, but they were wondering if the sled would work on, on the job site saw. So, let's find out. <clears throat> it looks like it will. I've used the MITRE 1000 MITRE gauge on this job site saw and I had it set up on the left track. The fence only goes on the right. Because the blade on this job site saw tilts to the left, you'd want to set up your table on the right side of the blade on the right track. But if you're doing that, it's, it's a custom cut. As you can see, my table goes over where the blade comes through, and that's because I have it set up on my contractor saw. So you wouldn't be able to go back and forth between the contractor saw and the job site saw, and that's totally okay with me. My table is dedicated to my contractor saw, but I can use the miter gauge on this job site saw, and I have. This sacrificial fence is maybe a little big, so if we remove that, then it's not quite so bulky, and I think this would work well. You could also use the drop panel. But again, this would be a custom cut for the job site saw. One other thing I want to mention about the sled on the job site saw is that you'd probably want to use both, I forget what these are called, the T retainer clips to keep it in the track because the table on the job site saw is so short and this is kind of bulky. Um, you'd want to have that clip in there so it doesn't tip out when you're in front of the blade. And then as you move through, You'd also want your clip on the back side too. I don't currently have that because on the contractor saw, I haven't found that I've needed it. But you'd have a lot of table hanging out here unsupported if you didn't have that clip in there. So make sure that you're using both of them. Well, I hope this video was useful to you. Keep those comments and questions coming. I really do enjoy interacting with my viewers. So until next time, my friend, be safe and love each other.